Um, we'll now be moving in to the final theme of the event uh, before we head into lunch and then our closing panel, which is academic communities. So these presentations will consider communities developed in educational settings, both within courses and departments, as well as at institutional level through student engagement in committees and working groups. So our first presentation is from the doctoral researchers group at the University of Strathclyde. Lewis Hill will be sharing with us their experience of supporting the postgraduate research community during the pandemic. Over to you. Okay, brilliant. Okay, hi everyone and welcome to our presentation. My name is Lewis and I'm supposed to be here today with my colleague Maisie and um, with both of us coming from the University of Strathclyde and specifically from the Strathclyde doctoral researchers group. But unfortunately Maisie is quite unwell today and so she's unable to attend. But before getting into the main topic of this presentation, where I'll talk about how we've had to adapt our community building activities to a virtual world, I'm going to briefly give some background on what exactly the DRG is. So the DRG was founded in October of 2018, with its purpose, original purpose being to provide representative voices from the PGR cohort to various university committees where policy decisions were being made. Over the years, however, the group has evolved to take on many new projects such as organizing university-wide academic and social events and working with the university to promote re positive research culture. And to give a bit of backstory as to why I'm here today presenting, I actually chaired the DRG back in 2019 up until October of 2020, which is when Maisie took over. I come from the Department of Physics within the Faculty of Science and recently I actually graduated from my PhD. I'm now beginning my new roles as a postdoctoral researcher and also Strathclyde's new PGR development officer for the Strathclyde Doctoral School. So as I was saying, the DRG has many aims and objectives when it comes to improving the PGR experience at Strathclyde. I should say um, PGR stands for postgraduate researchers. Um, but the topic which is most relevant here today is actually the building of a doctoral community. To begin with, I'm going to briefly talk about the community needs pre-COVID and the reasons as to why special importance should be placed upon building a community specifically for PGRs. So first of all, the demographic of people enrolled on PGR courses is very different to that enrolled on undergraduate and postgraduate talk programs. And these differences often cause many different problems to arise. For example, most PGRs are between the ages of 25 and 35. And this means that the social events organized by many social so um, sporting societies and student unions may at times be unappealing if aimed at a younger undergraduate demographic. Further, by the very nature of their day-to-day -day university role, PGRs can often find themselves feeling quite isolated or lonely. Unlike undergraduate and PGT students who attend lectures with many of their peers, PGRs focus on very niche areas of their wider research topic often working with but a handful of collaborators or perhaps even with just their supervisor alone. And it's for this reason that since its conception, the DRG has worked hard to provide many opportunities to bring PGRs from across the university together and build lasting friendships. Some of the photos from the events that we've put on over the years can actually be seen in the slide on the top right hand corner. I don't think it needs much further explanation. I think the audience will certainly understand that the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic and its resulting restrictions only compounded the existing feelings for many PGRs of loneliness and isolation, but not wanting to abandon our peers. And with the pausing of in-person events, the DRG had to quickly adapt to the new virtual world. And in this presentation, we've chosen to focus on two of our main projects which occurred over the last year. The first of these being the Doctoral School Multidisciplinary Symposium or DSMS. So the premise behind DSMS is that it provides a platform to bring together PGRs from across the university to present their highly specialized research to a general audience in an accessible manner. The first iteration of DSMS was back in 2019, where we held it as a one day in-person event and it attracted over 100 attendees. The event was considered a great success since not only did it bring together PGRs for wide reaching discussions and hence break down some interdepartmental and inter-faculty social barriers, it also provided the presenters with an opportunity to present their research using very different language to normalized, specialized conferences. Now in 2020, the event took a very different format for obvious reasons. Rather than running the event in person, we were forced to either cancel this symposium entirely or move it online. And this is where the timing of the event is very important. The event was due to take place very early in the pandemic and while now virtual conferences are the norm, 
back then, to some extent, we were wandering in the dark. In the end, however, we took the somewhat novel approach at the time to host the event via Zoom, splitting the presentations over three days and running the poster session via Twitter. Overall, the event was considered another great success, this time with close to 400 registrations, international keynote speakers without travel or accommodation costs, and it was able to achieve many of the other benefits of DSMS 2019. But I think, try as we might, we do all realize that there's no real substitute for in-person events of this magnitude. And that brings me on to the second of the major online community projects that we ran this year and that I want to talk about today. And the second being the PGR Peer Support Program. So the motivation behind this new social venture came out of recognition that in October of 2020, Strathclyde's primary intake of new PGRs were to be arriving in the middle of a pandemic, and hence were going to be experiencing a very different welcome to normal. Having spoken at three prior PGR induction events myself, one of the pieces of advice that I always give to new students is that it is just as important to build your new social support network through making new friends, acquaintances, and meeting colleagues as it is to understand your new research topic. However, I did think to myself, how many opportunities were there going to be in a lockdown Glasgow for this to happen? And in response, I began to put together the PGR Peer Support Programme. So the idea behind the program was that first year PGRs could sign up and be allocated to groups with between five to seven other first year PGRs with the groups themselves led by an experienced second year or higher PGR volunteer. These groups of PGRs from across the university, different faculties, different departments would then meet virtually for regular coffee or lunch breaks, typically three times a week for around half an hour. In the end, 150 of our approximate 300 first year PGRs signed up to the program, which was truly excellent to see. And I'm going to very briefly talk about some of the great outcomes which emerged as a result of our volunteers' hard work. So feedback from the PGRs engaging in the program highlighted a few ben benefits, which while brilliant to see, were certainly the intention of the program. Things like helping to tackle the feeling of isolation, providing a platform for mutual problem solving, and even a place to vent, but one piece of feedback spoke of a benefit which showed the true potential of support groups such as these. And I'm very quickly going to read out this quote from one of the volunteer group leads. So in a group of people from six different countries meeting for the first time, one man said, do I have to attend this? I thought I had to sign up. I don't want to tell people where I'm from. I always get judged. After being reassured that this program was to unite students rather than to judge, he continued to participate. Fast forward two weeks, and he is now the first person to reply to group messages, recommends new books to others, hasn't missed a single meeting, and constantly tells me how much he enjoys it. Now, of course, it's actually quite upsetting to hear that an international student was coming to the UK with an expectation of experiencing what may amount to racism. But to hear that the UK, Strathclyde, and the program has at least partially changed this expectation and has led to him making a new group of diverse friends is extremely heartwarming. So with that, I'm just going to wrap things up by giving an insight into what's next for the doctoral community at Strathclyde. So it's at this stage, I should really stress that one of the major strengths of the DRG is its adaptability and flexibility, with one of the big changes of this year coming from a fresh wave of volunteers who form specific communication and student engagement teams. These two teams, along with the peer support program and the iteration of DSMS, have been fundamental to bolstering the virtual doctoral community of 2020 to 2021. But it doesn't stop there, and the DRG is soon looking to launch the new PGR Strathlife blog, which will allow PGRs to write their own content and share it with the PGRs of the university. We've also recently begun a series of online interdisciplinary conversational events, and as I mentioned, DSMS will soon again be running once more. And so with that, I'd just like to thank you all for listening and actually invite you all to get in contact if you ever have any questions or indeed if you ever actually want to collaborate on any events. Thanks for listening. Um, next, we will hear from the Open University in Scotland on their Big Blether series. I'm pleased to welcome Vicky Sopper, Access Participation and Success Officer, and Elise Hawking, Area Association Representative for Scotland, to deliver this presentation. Over to you both. Um, so, my name is Vicky Sopper. Um, I'm Access Participation and Success Officer. 
at the Open University in Scotland. I was going to be uh, joined by Elise today, who is our Scotland rep from the OU Students Association, but unfortunately she's unable to make it. So you've just got me this morning. Um, but I'm going to be talking about our big blether series that we've been running. So the concept of a blether event is where students can get together in an informal environment to discuss issues of interest and concern. And this was conceived by an OU Students Association student representative. He'd run similar events successfully over Facebook. So in November 2020, the Access Participation and Success team, with input and collaboration from colleagues across the university, worked with our student reps to organize a big blether as part of Student Voice Week. The event was hosted on Microsoft Teams and it was attended by around 30 students and we had a number of Open University staff supporting the session by answering questions from students and providing clarification on issues of concern. Topics covered at that event included our response to COVID-19, finance and funding, careers and employability, learning and assessment, support and well-being and how students can get more involved. We followed up that event with an email to the students that attended that had links to the various sources of information, guidance and support that the staff panel shared at the event to ensure that that feedback loop was closed and students' questions were all answered. This was a really successful event and the development and publication of our student mental health agreement um, along with the success of this event led to us developing a further series of blethers with a focus on mental health and well-being to be hosted throughout 2021. The Big Blather series is intended to bring OU students um, in Scotland together to create community, a sense of belonging and to combat loneliness. It also aims to address challenges associated with mental health, breaking down those barriers and removing stigmas. So we've already hosted our spring blether, which I'll go into in a little more detail on the next slide. And we're currently planning our summer blether, which will be held in June. So the first event in the Big Blether series was the Big Blether Spring 2021. This took place on the 4th of March to coincide with University Mental Health Day. It was held again on Microsoft Teams and was organized by the Access Participation and Success Team and the Open University Student Association with some cross-institutional collaboration as well. The event was advertised by direct emails to students and also on social media. For this event, it differed slightly from the pilot event where we had a speaker for the first 20 minutes and then we opened the floor to students to ask questions of the speaker and the panel. Given that the event was during lockdown, we thought having a speaker to talk about health and well-being was appropriate. Um, our speaker was Yitka Veskova, who's a public health expert in the Open University in the Wells faculty. She's authored an open learn article about mental health during the pandemic and an article and video about aging well while self isolating. She's also been leading the Open University, um, Open University Voluntary Health Scotland's online event series about aging well, five pillars of well being, and she focused her talk on these five pillars. These are nutrition, hydration, physical stimulation, social stimulation, and cognitive stimulation. Along with this, Yitka demonstrated some exercises that people could do at their desks. And we really encouraged interactivity by asking attendees to do the exercises with her to practice them. So the aim of the Blether series for 2021 is to engage students meaningfully in the development of healthy cultures and communities, promoting good mental health and well-being through the sharing of knowledge and expertise. One of the long term aims of the project is to empower students to take these conversations forward and as informed by evaluation could be a continuing series of events post 2021. Because of that, evaluation for each event in the series is key to measure their success by gauging uptake and gathering feedback from students. So on the slide here, you can see um, some of the evaluation impact from the spring event. 
After the event, we sent a survey to all attendees to gather feedback from the event. And the questionnaire received 21 responses, which is quite good out of 30 attendees. 52% of respondents stated that the session was helpful and no respondents stated that it was not at all helpful. Overall, 90% of respondents considered the session to have been helpful in some way. We also asked respondents to highlight their favorite parts of the session and the presentation received the most votes. This was followed by the Q&A session and the interaction with other students and staff. We asked participants to select their least favorite parts of the session from the same list and explain why they chose them. 71% of respondents said they did not like, they did not dislike any part of the presentation. From the remaining respondents, one selected other because he joined the session late. Um, and one selected other explaining that he, quote, dropped off when people were asked to raise their hands to speak as he felt that it, it was resembled school and was too much of a classroom environment. Um, one respondent also stated that they disliked the presentation and the tips offered. And this was because due to disability, interacting with the physical exercises was not relevant to them. More than half of the respondents stated that they liked the information they received through the presentation and discussion and its relevance to their lives and health. And about 61% stated that they found the connection with fellow students, participation and communication with staff to be really valuable to them. We also asked the survey participants what their most wanted topics would be for future blethers in this series. And this, along with the information gathered from the evaluation has been used to inform the planning and development of our summer blether, which is planned for June this year. So the feedback from the spring blether was that physical health and exercise was one of the most wanted topics for future events. There were also really positive comments about the interactive exercises that YITCA encouraged all of the attendees to practice during the event. Whilst from feedback, we realized it was really important to take into account the accessibility of these exercises for all participants. It was agreed that YITCA would present at the summer event, ensuring that the exercises she suggested could be adapted by all. So in order to do this, we're going to provide a disclaimer on the registration form for the event, asking students to get in touch with us directly with details of any particular needs. And therefore we're going to try and find ways to support engagement for them specifically. The event is taking place on the 17th of June after our main exam period has finished. In the survey from the spring blether, we asked participants to select how often they would like these events to be held and the most convenient times for them. The majority of respondents noted that weekday evenings were preferable and that they would like to have the sessions more frequently. So we've responded to this feedback by holding the event on a Thursday evening. To be honest, for this event, we're not actually expecting a significant number of registrations for a couple of reasons. Um, given that lockdown restrictions are easing, people might want to be out rather than at an online event um, and our exam period will have just finished. So again, students might not want to be at a screen. However, given the feedback that we received from the spring event, we are keen to offer the opportunity to those who want to attend and keep the series going based on the feedback. And once again, we will be sending out a post event survey to all attendees at the event as well um, and we'll use responses from that to plan and develop our autumn blether and we'll do the same for our winter session as well. So thank you very much. Um, I will pop my email address in the chat so if anyone wants to contact me directly um, if there's not time for your questions after the last presentation then you can get in contact with me directly. Thank you. Uh, our final presentation comes from Lauren Wilson, School of Life Sciences President at the University of Dundee. She'll be presenting on a series of online events run by the School of Life Sciences. Over to you, Lauren. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks for coming along to listen today. As Alex said, I'm the School of Life Sciences President at the University of Dundee, and I'm hoping to speak to you a bit about the student-led social media pages we've used to, uh, this year and the virtual events we've hosted to engage with our students during a time where it has been quite hard to get face-to-face -face interaction. So first of all, when I was elected this year, um, 
I did realise that there was quite low engagement with our school's representative system and um, this is something that I did have the advantage of having a little bit more knowledge about as I've had previous roles within the school. Um, when I've been speaking to students the main thing I realised was there was actually quite little awareness of who the students representatives are and what jobs that they did. Um, we did have quite a few students, particularly our first and second years, who oh. Oh. and finally the other main problem was that students were unsure of the broad range of career paths that were available um, in a degree in life science. You broke up for a bit there. Do you want to maybe just uh, go? I think it was about halfway through we lost you. Perfect. I'll just go back. So, um, yeah, in summary, we just had quite low engagement with our school's representative system. A lot of students didn't understand who their representatives were or what it was that they did. And many of particularly our first and second year students who majority of their time had been interrupted due to COVID weren't sure how to excel in their academic work and what standard staff were looking for. Um, and the final point was that our students were unsure of the broad range of career paths that were available within the School of Life Sciences um, and with a life sciences degree and what things they should do to put their best foot forward and being successful and gaining a career um, in this field. So first of all, at the start of the year, we aim to highlight our representation system and rebuild what it was that we were doing. So we did that by having introductory lectures for each year group, highlighting exactly who the representatives were and what it was that they aimed to do this year. Um, so this means if students had any issues, they knew who to contact, they had their email addresses um, already uploaded to our um, academic platform that we use. And for our senior representatives, so myself being the school president and our team of vice presidents, we showcased um, who these students were and what their job was on student-led social media platforms. We've also used these platforms to advertise the role of representatives so that if students were interested in getting involved, they knew what it was they were going into and it helped them to make that decision and want to be a part of the community. So I'll just go on to talk a bit about these platforms now. So we have two main platforms, um, an Instagram page and a Facebook page. Um, feel free to give them a follow and you can look and see a bit more about the posts that is that we do on them. And at the start of the year, these were already in place, but I did a bit of a review and I realised that they weren't well utilised because the content was a bit random and um, it didn't seem to be reaching students and we overall just did have really low engagement. Um, at the start of the year we had 138 followers on these platforms for a school of nearly 800 students which I wasn't quite satisfied with. So by advertising these platforms at the lectures and any other opportunity that we did, um, this allowed us to get a growth of over 250% in our following, um, which is something that I was really happy with. So as I mentioned, and I thought it was really important to do this in quite an informal way so that students did know when to reach out for support, who to go to, um, especially in a time where it was quite isolating. And from feedback, we have many students are aware of the representative system in the school and what they do, which is something that wasn't apparent before. We also use this to um, advertise quite a variety of posts that we thought could help students. Um, so we did this by setting up small focus groups to understand what the students wanted from us as their representatives. Um, so we've done a Welfare Wednesday series that talked about um, mental health and welfare. So for example, that middle post there, we had tips for avoiding burnout. We also had things such as staying engaged when studying at home, um, how to 
manage your workload and take breaks um, and lots of different things, particularly for our international students actually, who had come to Dundee from all across the world and really weren't sure quite how to connect with us. And we also use these pages to advertise our academic events as, for example, you can see the one about our careers. We had was to combat students who were struggling with um, gaining academic success and didn't really know what the school were looking for. So this was our honours project information evening and this was targeted at our level three students going into their final year and choosing their dissertation topics. So from this we used um, a variety of fourth year students who covered a wide range of topics and we did it as um, an event where it was really informal, they could do a Q&A, find a bit about the pros and cons of each different project type um, and just get a bit more of an idea before they made a certain choice. Following yeah. this... Oh, sorry, Lauren. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, your internet keeps coming in and out. It might be good just to turn your video off just to make, just for the rest of the presentation, make sure we, do, we can catch it all. Perfect, is that better? Brilliant. Sorry about that, my internet is awful. Um, definitely a con of working at home. <laughs> so I'll just recap that. The first academic event we had was the Honours Project Information Evening. And that was aimed at third year students who were going into their final year and choosing their dissertation topic. It is something that we found to be quite intimidating because a lot of students haven't had any face-to-face -face contact in the past year um, and weren't sure of the wide range of topics available to them and how to do things such as reaching out to a supervisor, picking an area they're interested in um, and even just starting to prepare for the year ahead. So we used a variety of fourth year students who had covered a really wide range of topics in their dissertations and held it as a really informal Q&A session which the students could find out more about the pros and cons of each event um, and just get to grips of how they should plan their year and what it was going to look like because I think something we found really important was that students want to hear from students that have been through the same thing and sometimes when they're talking to staff it hasn't been quite as engaging because um, the staff know it from much more from a marketing and teaching perspective rather than actually going through it and doing the work. So following on from this we had the online exam revision tips event um, and again we held this after hearing feedback from students that they weren't sure how to prepare for these online exams because they are quite different to the typical um, going into uni pen and paper exams that most of us are used to. So what we did again was got a group of level four volunteers who had been through the online exams last year when we first went into lockdown and um, prepared questions in advance and just went through everything quite informally in order to make sure students were feeling much more confident about going into these exams, sharing a wide range of tips they could use to prepare themselves um, and also just talked a bit more about the setup of the day because it is something that was very long, it wasn't your usual two hour exams, it was for a 24 hour period. So this was really helpful um, in attracting the students and making sure they did feel a lot more confident even whilst they weren't on campus and the success of these events um, were shown because we had over 200 attendees um, which was absolutely fantastic and the final online events that we did um, were perhaps my favourite if I'm being a bit biased um, this was the online careers event so in past the life sciences school has always held careers events but they've been in person and with that some of the limitations we've realized is to get speakers it does take quite a lot of their time because they have to travel to dundee um, same with the students they have to be on campus and it was something that i think limited our engagement so from these events we actually set up a committee um, of I think it was roughly 40 students that signed up which was four times more than I've ever signed up in the past um, which was absolutely amazing 
and we reached out to lots of different researchers and graduates um, and different careers industries within the School of Life Sciences in order to make sure that we were getting such a wide range of careers the students perhaps didn't know was available to them. So this resulted in over 10 hours of stream talks from over 20 external speakers and we actually reached over 2,000 attendees, um, which is more than double, which was in our school, meaning that other universities were attending this event as well, which was absolutely amazing to us. Um, and I think the success of this was due to our social media pages. So we were advertising um, when the events were, what the itinerary was for them, sharing links to sign up, and also doing a bit of research and finding out what it was that students wanted to hear from. Um, and overall, we had really good feedback. And I think even in a post-COVID world, if that's a thing, we will continue to have these online because the flexibility of the event was just amazing. So um, just a sort of summary of what we've done and uh, points for going forward. Um, I think from this year we've learned a lot about the importance of advertising the work that's already going on because we had lots of amazing things that our student representatives were doing but students just didn't seem to know about it. So by utilising and promoting these student-led social media accounts we were able to do this in a way that students were paying attention to, um, as we know we're all on our phones far too much, so it was getting reached. Um, we also really found it was good to plan events as requested by students. So what I mean by that is at the start of the year, we didn't plan to have these academic talks about exam tips or dissertations, but we did realise quite a short notice that students were feeling uneasy about it. So it was really about acting um, quickly, just planning something really informal, and it really helped to ease anxiety during what's been such a difficult year. Um, and finally, by organising the career fair split into multiple shorter events rather than the traditional one day event, um, as was mentioned by the PGR group earlier, um, it was really, really helpful. Well, and we went from things that we didn't have before in order to perhaps start a mentoring scheme in future. Um, so yeah, that's all from me. Um, happy to answer any of your questions. I'm sorry about my rubbish Wi-Fi. <laughs> so thank you so much, and thank you to all the all the presenters. That was really fantastic uh, presentations. So we'll go to some questions. Um, first up for Lewis from Sabina. I'd love to hear a bit more about how the DRG was formed in the first instance in terms of how many people were involved before you got up to current engagement levels and I guess how it's grown. I think you're on mute. It started a couple of years ago. Lewis, are you with us? I think you're having some tech issues too. Bye. Are you there? Mm. Well, well, I think we'll we'll come back to you in a minute. Hopefully, your Wi-Fi decides to cooperate. Um, we'll move on to to question for Vicky, also from Sabina. Um, I'd be interested to know from Vicky how you plan to manage accessibility, in particular with regards to the tension between requests for more physical fitness content and those who are unable to participate. Thank you. Yeah. So as I said, for the registration form for this event, it's an online registration and we've added a free text box to our students to indicate um, if they do have any accessibility issues to provide details. We're then going to forward um, that information to Yitka, who's our speaker in advance of the event, so she can perhaps uh, provide some alternatives that we can email the student back about directly beforehand so that they have um, some options. The other thing we'll be looking at doing is making sure that our next event in the autumn 
is not focused on physical exercise. So this is just one in a series of events. Um, obviously, we want to make sure that the series is accessible to all. So we will try and make sure that uh, based on kind of feedback and evaluation of this event, we try and do something that might be a little bit more accessible for our next event as well. That's brilliant. Great to hear you looking at accessibility in design and in content. So that's brilliant. Um, over to Lauren. Uh, you have developed a very nice set of events for your students to help them prepare for their dissertations and online exams, which are very well attended and clearly valued by students. Will you continue to offer these next years in the next years and how will you build on your success so it's more proactive rather than reactive? Um, so next year I won't be with the University of Dundee anymore but I'm handing over to our new school president Nikki who's at this event today. Um, I think we do plan to do these again going forward. Um, so for example after the events we gained feedback about what it was students found useful, what things they would like to hear going forward and that means we can shape these events going forward um, in the future. Something that's actually came to us already is after a careers event, it would be really good not just have this one event at the end of the year, but actually smaller series of events throughout the year that could help students. So for example, we have a PhD application workshop coming up in November when these all tend to open. And this means that students can get support, not just when thinking about Um, in advance it should really help. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, we did unfortunately lose Lewis, uh, I think his internet has cut out. Of course it happens right in the last session of the day. Um, really sorry about that but uh, once he gets back on we'll send him some questions as well. So back to you Vicky, it's going to be just a double act for now between you and Lauren. Um, how, uh, Vicky, your students will of course already have been used to studying online. Do you think this helped in terms of developing online communities or did you find that there were still barriers that made this challenging? I think it really helped. I think one of the um, comments from the evaluation was that the studying online can feel quite isolating. And so having the opportunity to kind of come together as a community where we're not talking about necessarily academic content, but talking about kind of well-being and issues that students want to talk about rather than kind of us telling them what the content is going to be, I think really helped with that sense of community. And it was really nice to see in the in the chat panel on the event, students were maybe talking about issues that they'd faced and then communicating and interacting with each other to make suggestions about what they'd been doing to um, kind of get through the challenges of lockdown. So it was really nice to see this kind of online community developing. And that's why we're really keen to keep this series going. So it wasn't just a one-off event where students have community for the hour of the event, that it becomes something that they can look forward to and engage with the kind of leather community going forward. It's great to hear that um, that overlap of well-being and academia or education that you know we've all been so well aware of really coming to the forefront this year and, and taking hold in the sector. So that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, uh, we've got another question for you. Uh, oh, I think I'm reading my things wrong. Oh yeah, how do you intend to build engagement levels for the big blether going forward? We're doing promotion on social media. And we also email our students directly um, to let them know about the event as well. And we have a dedicated page on our website that students can go to that has a little bit of information about it as well. We do try and look at kind of events that might be happening around the time of the big blether to tie it in a little bit. So as I mentioned, the first one we did on university's mental health day. And I think that really supports engagement as well, that they can, students can see that they're not just engaging with this one event, but it's something that's tying in, in kind of a bigger picture context, which I think is really important as well. That's brilliant. Thank you. And for Lauren, um, how did you, or, how did you capture feedback to sort of inform the events? Um, and was there a preferred method or, or form? Miro seems to be the popular one of the day, um, but is there another one that you liked? Um, yeah, I've actually never heard of Miro, so it was really interesting for us. Maybe we could start using that going forward. Um, 
Something we did was actually using the student-led social medias on Instagram, there is a little function to drop in any messages and that was really good for gaining some really informal feedback. We also used surveys for our bigger events, um, however we were quite cautious for using them sparingly in order to avoid survey fatigue because we just didn't want to get to the point where we weren't getting any feedback because we're hounding people with questions. So I know some institutions you or some associations looked at um, for their Instagrams doing Instagram polls on stories. Did you ever try that as well, or was that did you not get as much engagement with the stories? Um, no, the stories were excellent for engagement. And um, whenever we put it out, we have a following of a roughly four ninety, but we were getting over two hundred people applying and um, answering each time. I think because it's so easy to do, people are on their phones already. We did find it was an excellent way of connecting with our students. Um, so I definitely recommend that going forward. There was the option to say, um, do questions that were just multiple choice answers to find out how people were doing things, as well as the more open question box where somebody could leave an actual response. That's great to hear. I think putting it in a in a space where students like to already be and engage is a is a great way to to keep the momentum going and and build that engagement further. So it's great to hear you had such incredible growth with developing that online social media space. Um, I have been told that Lewis has managed to get back in the room. Lewis, are you with us? I think you're on mute. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Do you need me to read the question again? Is that to me? Yes, yes. Yeah, sorry, I've just had to join on my phone. Hopefully that will sort the problem out. <laughs> no worries. So um, from Sabina, I'd love to hear a bit more about how the DRG was formed in the first instance in terms of how many people were involved before you got up to current engagement levels and I guess how it's grown. Yes, I think there was about 20 of us in the beginning back in 2018 um and this was sort of just to more of an events organizing committee i guess um and over the years just through each event that we put on we would always be advertising to come and get involved um so over the years it's just grown um exponentially i guess the numbers of sort of regular attendees to the monthly meetings um, and those that get involved in the various projects i think they're around about 40 this year um which is which is great as a, a natural core committee um, but as I was saying, DSMS last year, I think, reached up to 400 attendees. Um, but that's just building each year on each year, um, sort of getting bigger. That's brilliant. And how do you plan to continue to develop the mentoring groups for PGR students next session? How do you hope to retain the best of what has been established online during the pandemic? Yeah, so I think uh, it's quite nice because there's been so many first year PGRs that have really seen the benefit this year. But hopefully they will be willing to become the experienced volunteers next year. So hopefully they will have seen the best practice sort of taking place. Um, but on top of that, there's a training program that all of the mentors have to go through um, anyway. So hopefully we'll have a review process at some point, a survey of what went well and what could have been better. And then we'll incorporate that into the training. That's brilliant. Well, thank all of you for, present, for presenting and sharing what's happened at your institution. It's great to hear that overlap of well-being into academia, the meeting the needs of students and academic support, and how you've combated the issues that a lot of postgrads face in the online space. So thank you all for sharing. We will now break for lunch. Um, we have a half hour break. This is your last chance to contribute to the Padlet before we move to the questions in the panel. Um, and that will be the end uh, event of the day. So please be back at 1.20 and we will jump into the panel. So see you all soon.